Greetings, everyone. Welcome back. You've now had your last coffee break. We're going to plow on through to the end. And we have uh, two events to cap off an amazing day. Uh, we'll start now with our third panel of the day. And then we'll have uh, final remarks uh, that I'll come up to introduce before they are presented later on. Uh, but today, panel three is moderated by Kim Dozier, who's been writing for the Daily Beast, but who is soon to take over at Cypher Brief, which is already making a huge splash in this country, and I know many of you are users and followers. And uh, they're going to talk about counterterrorism, I'm sure in, in many dimensions, so I'll leave it to them to explain their specific interests. And so Bruce Rydell, in many ways, was a wonderful uh, transition from some of the morning topics to the afternoon topics, and I hope you enjoyed uh, his remarks as much as I did. Uh, Kim is joined by Major General Linda Urutua Varhal, better known as General UV, uh, because there are only so many times people like me uh, abuse her name that um, you know, she should be expected to listen to. But again, Uru Tia Varhal, a two-star Air Force general, remarkably capable woman who has done so much for our country um, at the uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. She is also joined by Bruce Hoffman, one of your long-standing and great professors here at Georgetown uh, with the Center for Strategic Studies and formerly of the intelligence community himself. And then finally, John Mulligan, the Deputy Director of the National Counterterrorism Center. So without further ado, over to you, Kim. Thank you. So I'm going to start with a question that is impossible for them to answer in two minutes. But since the whole premise of this um, talk is kind of impossible to contain in an hour, I want to set the tone of you know, really high bar. So a lightning round. Do we spend too much time and national resources on terrorism? General Yuvi? So I'm going to preface my remarks as we go all the way uh, through this. because. As I sit in there, as I sit as uh, the director of operations for our National Geospatial Agency, you have to remember I have 34 years in the, in the military, um, as, in the United States, in the United States Air Force. Um, well, we had cricket, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and and terrorism. I don't think we can ever step away from terrorism after 2001. I don't expect the American population will allow us to do that, but. Frankly, do I think we're a little out of balance? I, I do. Uh, China has continued to grow with their modernization. Russia has continued to, to challenge us in Syria. Iran keeps a low profile, but pokes its nose, pokes at us when we, when we need to. And you know, terrorism is here to stay. I'd like to see a better balance of things insofar as our peer partners, um, our, our non-peers, but continue to look at the neighborhood of, of Iran and the Middle East. And then, and then terrorism. By, but by I, peer partners, you mean like the members of the Five Eyes, uh, the uh, Britain, Canada, et cetera, or? Ab absolutely, I'm sure you're gonna talk about it later, but terrorism is becoming a community piece. There's no way that, that terrorism is done or we're looking at it from just a US perspective. We can't afford to. There's not enough of us here in the US or, or even with some of the other countries that it's got to be a community involvement around the international community. So I think it's becoming a more of an international problem for us to tackle uh, together, which will hopefully allow the US to balance a little bit more, at least from the military perspective. So your answer is yes, and we all just learned the term cricket. I have never heard that before. John. Uh, I would suggest, so I would agree with that. Uh, observation about the international nature of the of the terrorist threat. I think what we're really trying to confront is a, a, a true paradigm shift in terrorism. ISIS was described as a phenomenon, both in the degree to which it rose to uh, actually realize its ambition of establishing a f physical caliphate, and now in the fact that probably at some point this year that, that door is going to be closed in terms of what the physical caliphate, uh, the realization of that. However, it sees itself as a movement. It sees itself as a global movement. In 2014 to 2015, it mobilized a number of branches, and it's going to continue to try and reach across the globe. The interesting aspect of this is that now the terrorist threat, we see it manifested in the fact that it is trying to mobilize those individuals who at times have a very tenuous connection to its ideological basis and simply try to use them in many ways to execute 
terrorist actions against innocent civilians. But, it's but the they, tie. They that. It's the tie between media and operational activity that I think has been the real transition here. And that's why we need to be working not just in the physical domain of trying to contain them, but working across the cyber ideological domains as well. So it's a broader fight to answer but, your question. But, but to the, the original question, do we must spend too many of our national resources on terrorism? Is I it think, out of balance? I think right now we are in a position where we are trying to change that equation. We are trying to bring more, as, as General of UV said, bring more of our partners into the fight. So we've been in a leadership role for an extended period of time, since 2001. And I think now we are very consciously trying to share the load. I see what you're saying, but when you look at threats that Americans face, um, something like between 2001 to 2015, a statistic I read just before I came in here from uh, the New America Foundation, was that fewer than 200 people were killed in this country from terrorism, but more than 30,000 people were killed from handguns. So, Bruce, what do you think? Well, I'll answer the question too, too and keep things interesting to say no, not at all, but with an important, that, that, that I think our spending is appropriate, but with an important asterisk, that doesn't mean that we can't spend it smarter and more efficiently and better. I think that terrorism is one of the many threats we face and these threats are not constant and that we have to calibrate and adjust our responses. I think the big difference is that before 2001, terrorism had imposed a strategic threat in the way that it does now and just as John said, ISIS has a presence in 18 countries throughout the world, Al-Qaeda and perhaps two dozen. These have a profound impact on international relations, on international commerce, on the way immigrants are treated. So in addition to the actual physical threats that terrorism pose, it has a corrosive impact, deliberately so, on liberal societies, especially in pushing them to adapt increasingly illiberal solutions to their security. In answer to your specific question, well, you know, of course, more people die in road accidents than they do from terrorists, but the difference is that it's public tolerance of risk. And as in the United States, uniquely in the West, we have a high tolerance of legal private possession of handguns. And we consistently elect representatives to the United States Congress that uphold that right. That's a choice we've made. It's a very different relationship, I think, when it comes to looking to government to keep us safe from threats. And what I think is so anxiety producing and terrorizing about terrorism is it's part of a systematic campaign of violence, that if you don't address it, it's the threat that it's just going to continue and manifest itself in even more serious threats. So one of the questions we always ask in these kind of forums is, is it getting worse? Is it diminishing? We can see ISIS getting driven out of the territory it held in Mosul, in Raqqa, they're out of Tal Afar. Probably in six to eight months, Iraq will be clear of most of them. Syria, question mark. Uh, why have they spread to other countries? Does that, does that mean that they're actually reducing in influence or are they just morphing? Well, I think a certain part of it is they have been trying to recruit uh, other entities across the globe. Uh, remember that ISIS has been noted to be the most well-funded terrorist organization in history by actually taking physical territory, by plundering the resources of both Iraq and Syria. They've been able to, you know, they're very wealthy. So they have been able to... Are they, are they still very wealthy? Well, I, I, not my, as wealthy as they used to be, okay. and their, their, their resources are diminishing steadily. I, I thought they took the most of the oil that they, the receipts from the oil that they were selling, they were using to run the territory that they held. And I, did, were they able to move much of that cash to they other have, countries? They have had success in moving that cash to some of the other branches. They have had success in using other resources, not just the cash. They've been, for lack of a better term, they've been taxing the areas in which they control. They've been plundering antiquities, as you know. So they've develop multiple means of resources. So they've been able to attract a number of other entities that may have been operating terrorist organizations, that may have been operating independently, but they have joined the ISIS team because of the fact that there was financial benefit to those mm. organizations. W what I would suggest, though, when you asked about is the threat more, uh, the, the th 
the threat is transformational right now. What we, what we are seeing, it is not an Al-Qaeda model in which there was a, you know, elaborate plotting, hierarchical, lots of approvals, long-term orchestration of large-scale attacks. They are encouraging a number of smaller attacks, which they then employ media to amplify the effectiveness of those. So they're trying to create, as Bruce said, I thought very accurately, this corrosive effect, this, this idea of, of imparting to general civilian society that you are not safe, your government cannot protect you, and our success is inevitable. And that is the challenge that we're currently facing, is countering that message. So they've successfully morphed to some sort of a virtual caliphate that can be accessed from anywhere in the world, inspire anywhere in the world. Are they still, for a while there, they were in competition with Al-Qaeda for funding and recruits. Um, and also somewhat in competition with AQAP, the Al-Qaeda branch in Yemen. How are they doing now as they lose the prestige of holding a caliphate? I mean, is the virtual caliphate working for them? What do you think? Well, I mean, they still have a physical presence in some 18 countries. I think they've actually borrowed a page from Al-Qaeda's playbook in the same way that Al-Qaeda survived the greatest onslaught ever directed against the terrorist group in history by morphing into branches and franchises. ISIS has done the same thing. I think it's also gone one step further by cultivating an external operations capability that ensures, I mean, just as John said, at a much lower level than we've seen, but nonetheless, a level that still can inflict sharp jolts of pain into the West. And the, the bombing of the Ara Grande concert in Manchester in May was a perfect example of this that was linked to ISIS's branch in Libya. So, so let me yeah. just add, I, I think the virtual caliphate has helped them with, with recruiting. I don't have to own a physical space. They're disfranchised. 19 to 30 year olds almost in every country. And the virtual caliphate does not, they don't have to have a, a physical presence in that country. Because of what they've been able to do with the virtual caliphate, they've been able to recruit and get the grassroots, if you will, the lone wolves just by that virtual recruiting without actually having to own the territory. So I think that has really helped expand it from a regional uh, piece that we looked at 2001 to more of a global piece in, in 2015. And a lot of us too, it, it's a lot, especially for here in the US, it depends on how we define. Because we define terrorist and we define insurgency, sometimes they're the same, sometimes it's different. So I think there's sometimes the, the use of the, of the different words uh, kind of, um, they get meshed together and not necessarily defined as distinct entities of it being an insurgency versus a terrorist. I think sometimes you get all lumped into the terrorist portfolio, if you will. So that gets to the question of what is the soil that allows ISIS to take root or Al Qaeda before it? What conditions have to exist on the ground? Um, is it the attractiveness of their ideology or is it the lack of jobs? Well, it's a multitude of factors. Uh, in many cases, they're, they're able to flourish in areas in which there is insufficient security and stability uh, because then there are no checks or controls. But generally, yes, it is born sometimes of desperation. It is born of uh, estrangement. The, the, the rich irony for ISIS and its global reach is that they have successfully developed, and I will use this term, very clever marketing campaigns directed against a number of populations. Uh, you will note that they often are, have had a lot of success in recruiting folks who have criminal backgrounds. And for those folks, they tailor a message of, uh, you know, rehabilitation and that you can, of, and of redemption. You can, you can find ways to turn your life around with us. To people or, or to groups that are estranged or are, are feeling unattached, they have a message of come and join and be part of a community. So it really is, if you will, a clever stratified strategy of marketing that they use to appeal to a number of these different folks. So how can the U.S. intelligence community combat the estrangement that a 19-year-old Tunisian man feels? 
silence. Well, it's it's not a U.S. <laughs> intelligence it's not a U.S. Answer. intelligence community problem. That is a that is a Tunisian national problem, and that is why this has become such a global endeavor. You know, we work very very closely with a lot of our uh, with a lot of these. I mean. The counterterrorism battle is a true global partnership, and many of these nations have taught us different, uh, different, if you will, strategies and frameworks about how they offer off ramps to their citizens, about how they try to develop uh, mechanisms by which they can bring folks back into the fold, how they can, you know, again, try and create preemptive measures to prevent them from joining these organizations. But again. There's varying degrees of uh, varying degrees of success, and Kim, I'll tell you also, it's frequently a question of economics. In some instances, there aren't that many options. You know, we, we looked at Boko Haram, and for a lot of the individuals, you know, in Nigeria who joined that group, it was it was a question of they were paying and they could, you know, support families. So General General Waldhauser was just in from mm -hmm. Africom and talked about a program that Somalia has started where they offer Shabab members jobs and a way back into the society. And he says it's sort of on the fence right now because the high level Shabab members are seeing what happens with the first few. Are they really going to get jobs or are they going to end up um, getting turned on? Uh, and a lot of places apparently societies don't invite people back in mm -hmm. or want people back in. So I'll say it's forcing the IC to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Let me tell you what I mean. In the, in the old time, you, in the, when I first came in, you, you give me a classified, you put me behind the green room, and you give me some classified documents, and that's how I make it. <coughs> this, as they've said before, is a global. It's not the intelligence community. It's law enforcement. It's academics. It's NGOs. It's social media. It's everybody feeding this into it. So it's really become a community. So you're forcing the IC to become uncomfortable in taking those pieces that before you would never have put in your thought of when you were doing your analysis, such as social media, because they're very good at it, or you know, pulling the NGOs or academics, because they are many of them have that one piece that you're looking for, so it's just not a classified problem anymore. And for a lot of us, especially that have came up that way, you're going to be uncomfortable putting those pieces in, but we need that piece uh, to do it, and especially to go after them. How do we work an intelligence community, and when we're giving it to law enforcement in the way that they can um, arrest and take them to trial, that is a whole different way to how we handle information. Um, and that's forcing the intelligence community to become a little uncomfortable in how they're working with their partners and giving them the information they need to get to the end game. So that brings up the uncomfortable question of, you're talking about the IC, the intelligence community, learning to be more open to open source sources at a time when the current administration, like every other administration I've ever covered actually, is having a new like round of crackdowns on leaks. So how do you, how do you uh, thread that one? Talking, I, I've heard from other um, intelligence professionals that sometimes often we journalists are places they would like to be and they're reading our stuff and they'd like to have a dialogue, but, but, but they're not allowed. So how do you handle that? I, I love these awkward pauses. Well, I guess it's going to be. I'm trying to be polite. I got <laughs> lots of answers here. Uh, it, it, go, go ahead, John. Okay, so uh, if you're going to be an intelligent professional, you're trying to develop information from all types of sources. So, I mean, social media is just another domain that is now currently being examined for what information and intelligence you can get. I agree with uh, General Uv's observations. I think the intel community has evolved sufficiently and that more and more there is a greater willingness to engage and to ask those questions. We know that asking questions of reporters about their experiences by the nature of the questions we ask, we're revealing our areas of interest. But, I mean, that's a very, that's a very acceptable and manageable risk in the, in the, in the modern era. I, 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 think, I, I think it's true. I think there's so much information and so much intelligence out there. We really do need to be managing it with greater transparency. And it is, uh, I mean, there is a lot more sharing going on. When we have disclosures, 
and disclosures that cost people's lives or put sources but or by technologies you at mean risk. Unauthorized disclosures. Well, any kinds of disclosures. Oh, okay. I mean, disclosures. So we've had situations in which we were sharing information about terrorist threat information with uh, global partners, and that information got leaked. Mm -hmm. And an intelligence, not just an intelligence operation, but a counterterrorism operation was jeopardized or compromised. We would have to sit down with those partners and say, look, we cannot continue this relationship unless you are able to more successfully manage the information that we are. And of course, the U.S. has had some high profile. We've had our, excuse yeah. me, we've had our own exactly yeah. disclosures that have uh, uh, jeopardized our relationships. We've had uh, senior elected officials who have revealed very sensitive information. So I'm so glad you said that so that they didn't have to. <laughs> Of uh, the uh, and and I'm I'm being I, I'm being um, stirring at the pot here because look from a journalist point of view um, we also one of the reasons people give us information is they see when we're on the battlefield um, when we're in an area of conflict is they see us as an honest broker who isn't a tool of an intelligence operation so we actually can't sit down and have that conversation either um, I'm I'm just poking the bear here. Let, so. let me share one, one point, and I, I think this is very important. From a counterterrorism perspective, we need to continue to accept our leadership role. We have a leadership role. It's predicated, again, experientially. We've had these terrible terrorist experiences over the years. We have a lot to teach a lot of our partners about how our intelligence and national security community comes together. All of that is true. But we should not be presumptive, presumptuous, that we have the solutions for the global counterterrorism problem. Many of the solution spaces that we have seen across the globe have been offered to us by other partners who have developed localized solutions to their problems, and we have tried to borrow from that. So that, I think, is a very important part of our longer-term strategy. It is trying to learn from many of these other nations what experiences they have been able to derive from their but, you know, but As we manage problem. risk with our, with our customers, I, I, a big piece of it is being uh, is, is to build trust between the two. But the other piece I'd argue is, they talked about too, is to be honest. Hey, look, with all this information going back and forth, something's gonna leak. I mean, when we share information, it's just gonna do it. That doesn't mean we're not gonna learn from our le leaks and talk about it, but we need to be honest with our partners and they need to be honest with us for whatever reason. And a lot of times, we don't, we, we, we just, uh, you know, well, we're just not going to share with them anymore. That that's not the that's not the answer anymore because, especially with the, our 24-hour news cycle, CNN, Fox News, all those, it doesn't allow us to stop. Nobody can stop and hold information again. That's just not viable in this in this world today. Well, the Bin Laden raid was tweeted as it happened. Exactly. So case mm -hmm. in point. So um, that brings us to the question of public trust. Um, you're talking about the tension of, you know, how much information do you share um, among partners? Well, I watched, I lived through reporting on the leaks of Edward Snowden when um, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Guardian had both the documents and stories that they'd worked on for months that were suddenly published. And I had documents that, frankly, I would have needed a law degree to understand and, and years in the IC, uh, and I was calling up the intelligence community saying, can you explain this? Can you give me a counter narrative? Because otherwise, I'm just gonna read the New York Times, the Washington Post, et cetera, the narratives that, that are out there, because I respect these journalists, they've worked on this for a long time, and I'm going to be doing a write-up of their version of events, quoting the documents that they've ma made available to me. And that's what the public is going to believe if there's no pushback, and it, it took months before NSA was allowed to in any way um, even say things like, no, anything more than they got that wrong. Well, which part did they get wrong? So let me, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Mark will correct me as I go down this road, but I don't know if you guys I, I can think, see he's pursing but, his lips. But, but I think everybody needs to remember the context of and, and the timing. In and by its, that's where the answer was, is you asked NSA. In and by itself of that document, it could have been an NSA could have said, no, it wasn't important. What we were trying to do at that time is get our arms around the multitude of documents he had taken to see, were we at a risk overall? What do we really need to protect that? Okay, well, yeah, that one was not bad boy. If they get that one with that one, 
that's the story that we need to, to work with the, the journalists to, to kind of portray what, what those pieces were going to put together. And at that time, and it took months for us even to get an idea of the multitude of different documents he had, and more importantly, what he didn't have to say that that was the, the uh, what, was, what risk we were at, because we so, really, really didn't know. I understand, but as the news media was releasing it document by document, with a slow response, um, I, I would argue that you were still dealing with the public's reaction to that news coverage at the time, to this day, as on Capitol Hill, they're trying to um, reauthorize 702. 702, as it's been explained um, to me uh, and by people like Admiral Rogers at NSA multiple times, that it is the ability to look at the phone records of a terrorist suspect overseas, including anyone who's talking, he's talking to or she's talking to in the United States, which means it's a seen by privacy advocates as a backdoor way of letting NSA or CIA spy on Americans, even though it's authorized. So um, how, do you, how do you tell that story and win them over that it's needed? It's a, it's a, uh, it's a very challenging uh, problem. Uh, you have to be in a position in which you are communicating, just as you state, what the actual, uh, what the actual process and the mechanics are, but you really have to be measured in how you characterize the degree of insight that it's giving to you. The challenge that NSA and the other intelligence agencies face is that every time they speak to the American public, they are also speaking to the terrorists. They are also speaking to those who would do us harm. Uh, it would be a great uh, mistake to underestimate the degree of thought leaders that exist within ISIS and within Al Qaeda and some of the other affiliated organizations who spend considerable time, resource, and, uh, and application trying to divine and discern what our strategy strategies are, what our capabilities are, and finding mechanisms by which they can defeat that. I don't want to take us off subject, but I'll give you an example. So, you know, every once in a while, we see situations in which we have to make adjustments in our global posture, say, for example, in terms of aviation security. Uh, and people then say, oh my gosh, we're, we're seeing, uh, are we seeing a new threat? No, what, what is happening is, there has probably not been a period of time since 2001 in which these terrorist organizations are not trying to have success in an aviation plot or activity. May it may be an ID on an aircraft, may it be trying to recruit pilots who would take aircraft, it, it, just through any broad variety of activities. But what happens occasionally is we either discern that we have a technological gap that we didn't know about before, or we get some particular insight about a specific threat that causes us to raise, it, raise the alarm. So that's the kind of balance that we are trying to maintain. We're trying to ensure that folks Folks are sufficiently, if you will, energized without being uh, feeling overly threatened at all periods of time. And of course, the moment you made that announcement, the race was on for all of us journalists um, to figure out what had you discovered that prompted you to say no laptops on planes from certain countries. Yes. Um, so, Bruce, what do you think? Are they? Do they have enough? capital invested with the public, that the public will understand what they need to do, the IC writ large? Well, we want it both ways. We want the IC and we want those charged with the protection and defense of the United States to thwart terrorist plots. But then we wring our hands when we believe that they have too many powers. Um, in a way, some of the discussions here and this morning strike me as, as, as slightly laughable. The concerns about government, I'm less concerned about the government than I am about Equifax being hacked and releasing personal data of millions of Americans, over 200 million accounts that have a much more direct impact than on the reauthorization of 702. So let me, so the quote that we always use is there's operational successes and there's intelligence failures. There's never been termed as intelligence successes. Why? There are many threats that we have thwart, thwarted. The American public, for good reason, they don't know. Many of, of everybody that we've done in the IC, we've, we've stopped many, both with our, 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 our partners and here on the United States. But that, that's not why our, the intelligence community does what we, what we do. We keep America safe. That's what we're supposed to do. But a lot of times, it, it, we don't, 
We don't sing our praises. We've never done that in the whole time that I've been in, in the intelligence community for, for a good reason. But um, I, I think if the public knew of, of everything that we had, we had thwarted, um, and maybe we told our story better, they might understand the, the 702. But, but Admiral Rogers and um, Director uh, Coates, we just stand on what our IC community has done throughout the years to, to save all the folks, not trying to say we're trying to save the intelligence community and uh, by, uh, by you know, not taking away some of the uh, privacy acts that we have to, to to keep America safe. That's what we do. That's what we get paid for. So one of the results of what we're talking about is big data, um, more data than any human can consume in a lifetime. Um, how are you doing in terms of using that data to predict whatever the next wave is going to be? What is, what is ISIS 2.0, ISIS 3.0? Is the data helping? I'd, I'd say the data is helping, and I'd say that we are automating and using models when we can, but the models are just the models. They have to uh, transform themselves to model to real world where you can have just the little stuff of, Maybe the timing wasn't right, or maybe the one that was going to do that attack, you know, uh, got hit by a bus the day before. Too bad. But um, so that's where you're really kind of doing that to to kind of to kind of weigh weigh that that stuff. And you and I have talked about that before, especially wearing this uniform. There is so much data out there. We have so many assets up there. Are so many assets that are out there anyway. The big data that is coming in, the ability to automate it. You, you can automate it all you want, but the, the final piece for us is really to get it in the hands of somebody that can do something about it usually takes a human being, and that's where our limited resource, and will remain our limited resources as we continue to go down this road. And John, that is your job, that fusion. Yeah, I gotta say, uh, the promise of big data is both, uh, it's uh, intoxicating and it's uh, a little bit uh, intimidating. Intimidating in the sense that you wanna make sure that you have adequate controls on the data that you're using, but you also need to be in to, to ensure that you're able to leverage it uh, to the greatest extent possible. What we have found though, and I'll give you one example, uh, a number of our partner nations have set up efforts in which they attempt to uh, monitor the online videos of terrorist organizations and then they make referrals to service providers to say, please remove that video, please remove that video. And, uh, you know, again, just uh, there was some publicly released information last night that said that 400 hours of video is generated on YouTube every hour or every minute, 400 hours a minute. It doesn't scale to human cap capability. So at some point in time, we are going, if we want to remove a lot of terrorist content, we are going to have to depend increasingly on big data uh, and, and all sorts of, uh, if you will, uh, various logarithms and filters that will allow service providers to be able to identify those folks who are using their platforms in this way. Which is again giving up a bit of privacy in terms, in, in return for security. Um, I want to turn to some provocative questions from the audience. <laughs> um, this one is from Jim Dubik uh, from Georgetown. Um, are we stuck with the term terrorists when those we fight use terror in the attempt to depose governments that they call apostates and replace them with Islamic governments of a particular kind, wouldn't they be more accurately called revolutionaries? Bruce? Well, it's not that revolutionaries <laughs> don't use terrorism. I think that's one of the problems we have definitionally is we look to fasten on one definition to the exclusion of all others that somehow is going to impart in the tersest and purest fashion clarity. It doesn't exist in terror. It doesn't exist in most phenomena in political science. What's, the, what's an agreed upon definition of democracy or an agreed upon definition of a fascist, for example? There aren't, but it doesn't mean that they don't have important, useful elements in discourse and in research. So I think that terrorism is a manifestation of insurgents, of revolutionaries, of people who use terrorism and, and we could more easily label them as terrorism. But you know, part of the problem is that historically, no one wants to be called a terrorist and terrorism has become this pejorative term and also is burgeoned to become more of a catch-all, but we have to look at the act itself. So the act of, um, one way to define it would be ignoring the Geneva Conventions, targeting civilians as part of your strategy. 
I would say targeting non-combatants. There's a difference between civilians and non-combatants. I mean, is it legitimate to kill diplomats? Is it legitimate to kill aid workers? Um, I mean, they represent government. They represent national power, the West. And I, I mean, I argue for a more expansive definition than a more restricted definition. So there was a big debate during the campaign, of course, as to do you need to call them, do you need to call it radical Islam? Do you need to say radical Islamic terrorist in order to um, guide and make your mission more effective? Where do you guys, what do you all refer to them as day to day? Terrorists. Terrorists. Uh, no, I mean, yes, I understand that there was a, a I mean, there, a lot of folks believe that we should be focusing very much on radical Islam. Uh, what we see, I mean, what we see within our center is the fact that there are, there is a political agenda that is utilizing religion and is appealing in that. I mean, so that, we don't have any kind of major issue with calling it radical Islam or not. I think that, uh, you know, again, these are terrorist organizations. I, I am a ter counterterrorism practitioner. That is how, you know, my, my job is defined as trying to ensure the safety and security of the country. I don't really get into the political labeling. Well, I just want to say that, that to me that was a, a uselessly imprecise term because it was meant to denote a certain kind of terrorism, which was terrorism that I would say more specifically Salafi jihadi terrorism or Sunni terrorism. But in fact, radical Islamic terrorism, it's, it's not res restricted to any one arm of, of, of Islam. So, you know, the way it's used is also as important as the terminology itself. I don't think we should be, I mean, I wrote a book about Jewish terrorism, the role it played in creating the Israeli state. I think you call it what it is. So uh, another good question, this is from Brandon of SSP. How does the U.S. conduct counterterrorism without an updated AUMF um, authorization for the use of military force? I think I got that right. What would a better legal framework look like? And of course, the, he's, uh, Brandon's talking about the fact that the um, war on terror is being conducted on the back of the 2001 anti-Al-Qaeda AUMF that has been stretched to add ISIS um, without ever actually going back and having Congress redraft anything. So w would your job be easier, um, General UV, if you had an updated I, AUMF that gives you wider remit to target? I, I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, I, I think it was such a, uh, when 2001, when Al-Qaeda Al hit us, uh, we were trying to figure out what, what to do with, to make it, I wouldn't say make it easier, but to focus us especially in the military, and the enemy was Al-Qaeda. It was really terrorism for what happened on, on us, much like you know in World War II when the Japanese hit, it was the Japanese at Pearl Harbor. It was the terrorism at Al-Qaeda. Because of the ideology, which is really hard for DOD to target, because we always, when we DOD, to take down an enemy, we do our centers of gravity. The center of gravity for a terrorist organization is ideology. It doesn't matter if it's Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, it could be you know, ISIS, it, it, it's, it's ideology. It's really hard to get that, that center of, of gravity. But I think the ideology and what terrorism represented through Al-Qaeda, I think it's no different than some of the other groups that we have now. I think that has really stayed consistent on from coming from Al Qaeda for us in this so far as DOD is concerned and it's truly really for the self preservation of folks and uh, people um, out there against this ideology, if you will, of, of what really behind the terrorism piece, which really to me emanated from Al Qaeda in two thousand one. So I, I would suggest that uh, in this instance, the authorized use of military force still is a useful framework. Uh, lawyers groups within the National Security Council, the, count, the count, general counsel offices of all of the uh, participating agencies very rigorously consult the AUMF whenever there is going to be some kind of proposed action uh, that is going to occur in the terrorism sphere. It, it's a very rigorous process. Uh, y you know, should, should there be a reexamination? If, if the judgment is, yes, just because it's been in function for a long period of time and we'd be more comfortable if we had a more modern examination of it, okay, that's fine. But right now, I 
would tell you that I think that there is a great deal of rigor applied whenever we see a situation in which, okay, we have to enter into a new area of operations with potential For, for instance, terrorism. when Al-Nusra started terrorism. targeting um, U.S. or allied targets in yes. Syria, but then they changed their names so that they weren't related to Al-Qaeda mm -hmm. to try to yes. get out. They thought that would get them home free and clear from the AUMF. Yes. Didn't work, did it? No, it didn't work. Care to elaborate? No, I mean, like, okay, well, I, I'll even go further. I'll, I'll take you even further back than that. I mean, the Al Nusra Front was stood up in 2011, 2011, 2012, by Al Qaeda as a means to obscure their activities uh, within Syria. And they were intended, you know, portray yourselves as a humanitarian organization, portray yourselves as an opposition organization, win hearts and minds, and then over time, when you reveal that you are Al Qaeda, people won't mind as much. So there has been a pattern of obfuscation that has existed since that organization has, it was first founded. And Bruce would know, you know more detail about it than I do, but that is, again, a, a, a continuing pattern of how terrorist organizations do attempt to uh, conceal their activities. Which is exactly what Bin Laden talked about in the first tranche of Abbottabad documents that were released, how we wanted to rebrand Al-Qaeda for exactly as John has described. So let's revisit that question I'd asked earlier, and we sort of went down a, another direction of what is the next wave? Is it ISIS combining with Al Qaeda? Is it ISIS combining with um, criminal transnational groups to fund it and keep going? What, what, what do you all see when you look into your really scary crystal ball? So Kim, your, your application of creativity in presenting that question uh, is exactly the way we look at it. Uh, it could manifest itself in a number of ways right now. Uh, you, you know, this is an organization that sees that it has a global mission, sees that it has enduring financial requirements. So do we expect that they would m morph into more criminal activities? Certainly they will if we are able to deny them a lot of their current revenue streams. So we could expect to see more of those types of criminal activities. We could most certainly expect to see them becoming much more of a cyber threat. We see them speaking aspirationally, and I'm just going to go back to what Bruce observed about Equifax. Those are some of the signposts we should be paying particular attention to. Uh, to date, what we've seen is that ISIS has only been able to basically do low-level exploitation of, you know, some uh, personally identifiable information. They, they're able to go into some websites. They do low-level website defacements. They steal data, and then they try to use that data to say, target that person. That person's, you know, this is a military family, target them. These are law enforcement people, target them. But one could imagine that they would have far higher aspirations about cyber type disruptions uh, to infrastructure and to civilians, uh, par partly because of the fact that it's inexpensive and it's difficult at times to, to attribute responsibility. Now, they will want to take responsibility for it, but that's where we can see them evolving in the future. Have you seen that work yet, i.e. they suggest someone gets targeted and then that person does get targeted in the United States? We have not seen people actually being targeted, but we have seen them certainly putting out death information or targeting information. Holy cow, the list of 8,000 yeah. American citizens with their home, sometimes office addresses, mm -hmm. their email addresses, their cell phone numbers, was released last Mar March. I tried to print it out. It ran to something like 425 pages before I canceled it. 8,000? 8,000 8, names. Uh, you, members of the U.S. military, was it? All kinds of people oh, from all yeah. over the country. And so looking at that, you know, of course, one checks that list for, for, for lots of different <laughs> reasons. Um, but. It was remarkable. There were some individuals who I didn't know personally, but I knew the addresses of U.S. government facilities scattered around Washington. So this wasn't just like a shot in the dark that it was quite random. They, they had at least some knowledge. And yet, even with all of that information out there, you haven't detected an attack. That brings me back to the question of, are we, is this the monster under the bed that we're over-imagining? Or no. have they just not gotten no, to that point No, I don't think yet? it's the monster in the bed. I just don't think they haven't. I, I, I think it's, you know, they just haven't realized their success in that regard yet. I do think they will continue. Uh, we, you know, we had an instance uh, during the uh, European Cup, you may recall, uh, a, an individual uh, killed a policeman and his uh, partner uh, outside. It was, a, it was in France, but it was a bit outside Paris. And that individual live streamed 
the event. So I remember thinking at the time that was a rather chilling turn. And so it's not beyond the impossible to think that's another way in which they will attempt to amplify their terrorist activities is trying to find ways to, again, increase the, uh, the broadcast capability of what they're trying to achieve. Well, they went to the police officer's home. I mean, that's, that's what right. was so chilling. But this goes exactly to your point you made earlier about commercial aviation, is that the threats we're seeing today first manifested themselves 22 years ago with Ramzi Ahmed Youssef when he perfected the use of lithium batteries as a way to power liquid flight explosives. And this was uh, the dry run for what was called Operation Bohinka, which was a plot to blow up 11 US airliners over the Pacific. And it's that the terrorists haven't forgot about that technology. They're now harnessing it in different second or third generation manner that makes it much more threatening because they conceal them not only in, in laptops, but in uh, even uh, tablets. And why I don't think that it's creating monsters out of nothing, I would rank Al-Shabaab as like the third or the fourth team, not you know, the A team, the top. But yet in February 2016, Al-Shabaab successfully got an explosion. Now, admittedly, Mogadishu Airport doesn't have the same security that Heathrow or Dulles does, but nonetheless, they still implanted a, an explosive device in a Somali aircraft that, that fortunately detonated before the plane had reached cruising altitude, so averted a tragedy. But even the lower tier terrorist groups are able to smuggle explosives onto exactly. aircraft. So I don't regard the TSA warnings of, of the spring as at all uh, alarmist to creating monsters. I think this is a genuine threat. In part, I mean, we've been enormously successful, the intelligence community, the military, law enforcement, in thwarting so many of these huge threats. Um, but that shouldn't breed a complacency because terrorists are always trying to stay one step ahead of our successes. Because in their home countries, they have nothing, literally nothing better to do. Nothing with the sense of mission that they could join that gives them what this gives them. Well, it's just not that. We, boy, they, they are very good at recruiting. I, I mean, I, I talked about the disenfranchised youth, but they're pretty good at recruiting PhDs. They're pretty good at recruiting just the, the folks who are playing on the computer right now, because we're all so connected on our computers and the, and the network the infrastructure that in, in each country. I, I mean, I think that's where we're, I think probably one of our biggest fears is the virtual caliphate that they continue to, to grow. One, for the recruiting, and two, the things and the massive destruction that they could possibly bring. As, and that sometimes is just recruiting the, the young hackers who are really very, very good that can, that can go ahead and offer them that capability. So what is it about us, the US, the West, our behavior, that becomes such great grist for their recruiting mill. I mean, how are they recruiting that PhD? What are, what are they offering that person? Well, as I said at the outset, it's often tailored to what that person's needs are. Uh, what we've seen very interestingly, so, so I mean, again, uh, I, I, I don't want to get into a theophilosophical discussion, but people need meaning in their lives and people need connectivity and they seem to be able to find those kinds of individuals who are looking for some kind of meaning, who are looking for some kind of connectivity and feeling the vo filling the void. Uh, they have an ideology. We would say that they have appropriated currently certain parts of Islam and they have, you know, they have twisted it and changed it and morphed it into, some, into a solution that works for them is probably the simple way that I would frame it to you. But they are able to attract those folks because, again, for whatever reason, those folks ha have a, have a belong need to belong. Many of the people that they recruited, it was interesting. I talked to folks and they said to me, uh, you know, talk to me about how all these uh, people ended up in Syria. And I said, you know, in, 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 that very, in those very early days, 2012, 2013, I would have told you it was not unlike rushing a fraternity or sorority. Uh, many of these folks, very well-intentioned, wanted to go to Syria, wanted to help you know, fight in the liberation of Syria, and they ended up joining groups in which, as Bruce and I mentioned, in which they didn't realize they were terrorist organizations. And so over time, they developed those affiliations. Now they have perfected their messaging, or at least honed it to a very high degree, and they are able to employ, uh, you know, a number of various platforms on the internet to reach out to people and to you know, develop online relationships and to recruit those folks. I mean, it, it's very, very interesting. If you talk to a lot of our international partners, one of the points that they would have said is, 
Many, many years ago, we could have pointed to a region. We could have pointed to uh, religious leadership. We could have reported to a, a mosque and say, that's where terrorist elements are bred in our country. You know, there is some sort of, if you will, physical attribution or some sort of physical manifestation they could describe. Now what they say is, most of our young people are, are radicalized online, and we don't know where that radicalization is originating from. It could be any part of the globe. So it is a very different environment that we're operating in at the present time. So um, the Daily Beast just reported before, just before we came out here that um, an American ISIS member has surrendered uh, himself in the Syrian war zone. Now, I assume you guys aren't going to confirm that here, though I'll be fine if you do. Um, <laughs> But what can you learn from people like that? And how should that person be treated legally now? Well, <laughs> okay, well, I can presume that within the United States, if that is a US citizen, that person will be charged, uh, charged with probably material support to terrorism. Uh, but I, I don't, you know, I don't know the particulars, but uh, there will be an engagement and uh, legal process will obviously uh, follow. But then also what there has been is individuals then, uh, per perhaps as part of whatever legal arrangement or whatever their sentencing is, many of them agree to uh, you know, talk about their experiences, share their, their experiences. We have found that there has been considerable value in uh, these individuals telling us their stories, telling us about their journey. Um, most of these journeys are very individual things, right? I mean, there's no set piece. You know, at one point in time, we thought that, wow, maybe we can ascertain how long it takes people to radicalize online. Well, what we found is a lot of variation in that. And for some people, it was a very long-term process. For others, not so much so, sometimes accelerated by developments in their personal life. So, I mean, we'd be interested, I, I would be interested as an intelligence guy to learn this person's story. Uh, Bruce, what would you, how would you employ that person? Well, I mean, there's, there's an important, I think, counter-narrative message that potentially one could exploit, especially uh, if the person's own odyssey was, and the reason they surrendered is because of disenchantment, disillusionment, abhorrence at having to commit acts of violence that they thought went beyond the pale of humanity, and to use that as a beacon or a message to other would-be jihadis or other would-be um, acolytes or recruits to ISIS to dissuade them. Are we, as a nation, as an intel community, are we good enough at that? At, at turning that message around, counter-messaging? I don't think so, but for two reasons. Firstly, the complexity of the reasons that people become terrorists or join terrorist groups, as mm -hmm. John explained, is, is, is infinite. So it's very difficult to have one message. But, but then also, I think there's two other reasons. One is these types of efforts have always been remarkably poorly resourced. I mean, if you have terrorist groups that are putting out 20,000 tweets at whatever period of time and 50 people sitting in a government agency, I mean, how can you compete with that? I mean, there's just, there's just, there's just no way. But I think a, a bigger problem, which goes back to a, an earlier discussion we had, is getting the sequencing right. I mean, in the United States over the past decade and a half, we veered from seeing only a military solution to terrorism and then seeing only a countering message, only a counter messaging or counter radicalization solution. And I think we have to get the sequencing right. Sometimes you need the military force to diminish a terrorist group's strength and thus thereby counteract its allure, to deprive it from sanctuary and safe haven, which Bruce Rydell was speaking about earlier, which is of course you know, the Sinoshore, the, the physical, actual manifestation of where people can go to join a group. But then once we do that, we have to be equally good and equally effective at developing these messages and developing the means of achieving local and regional stability that prevents the regeneration or the recrudescence of these groups and of people wanting to join them. So, as we're reaching the end of our time here, I'm going to take a question from Twitter. Once ISIS loses its territorial holdings in Syria, do you expect al-Qaeda, perhaps under the leadership of Hamza bin Laden, to attempt to assert authority over the ISIS operational network? Is that something that keeps you up at night? There are so many things that keep <laughs> me up at night. Uh, no. I, 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 it's a very complicated relationship. <laughs> uh, Between ISIS and Al-Qaeda? ISIS was born of Al-Qaeda. Uh, mm -hmm. ISIS sees itself as the newer and more improved Al-Qaeda. In various parts of the globe, ISIS and Al-Qaeda have an uneasy 
coexistence, cohabitation. In other parts of the world, they are competing for the same pool of, of uh, employees, if you will. Uh, so uh, do I think that, uh, think that Al-Qaeda would move to fill whatever vacuum would be left? Yes, if they could. Uh, they're, they're trying to achieve their own, you know, their own uh, objectives, and so whatever strengthens them. But again, the, the physical, uh, the physical uh, reduction of ISIS-held territory does not reduce the threat posed by the organization. We have been relentless in our messaging to uh, senior leadership in that regard. It, it doesn't take that much to execute uh, a terrorist operation in the modern era. So we don't see them, we, we don't see a reduction in the threat to U.S. persons, U.S. resources from this territorial loss that they're, that they're currently experiencing. We see a shifting threat. Uh, so again, I think Al-Qaeda would, I think Al-Qaeda is consciously trying to employ Hamza bin Laden as a younger person, possibly ex uh, trying to appeal to the younger demographic uh, that ISIS has successfully captured. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we shall see what happens. So far, Al-Qaeda has not been able to demonstrate the, abil, the, uh, the degree of media facility that we have seen in ISIS. So I'd like to end on a question that involves the future of the IC, in that we're sitting here with a group of students, some of whom you'd presumably like to apply um, for jobs in the US intelligence community. You've been fighting Al-Qaeda and then ISIS for more than 15 years. Reward versus burnout. How do you measure it? When, when you go home at the end of the day, how do you feel? So, so why should they join? It is the most operationally satisfying thing I can imagine. Uh, so NCTC is hiring. So. <laughs> I'm so glad that Kim mentioned that. I'm inviting all of you to go online, usajobs.gov, and check it out. We're hiring right now. Thank you. Uh, uh, the, and, the, and the other reason we are hiring, we're hiring folks who come out of college. We're, we're hiring younger people because what happened, and I'll just tell you, our organization was initially formed. They took the Intel community and they said, mm -hmm. we're going to bring analysts from across the community and we're going you know, to put them all in this place it's a, as a fusion organization. And then we realized is most of those folks were older. Most of those folks didn't have the, if you will, the more native facility in the digital realm. So we said, my gosh, we have to hire a different demographics. We have to bring people in who are of the same demographic of those, uh, of those terrorists that we are trying to counter. Uh, what I will tell you is, it's a, yes, it's rewarding work. We, we're, I, I don't find that there is the degree of, how can I say it, uh, ambivalence one might have in other parts of different missions uh, that you might pursue because of the fact that anyone that looks at my children as legitimate combatants is somebody that I feel that I need to stop. So I think it's very satisfying work and I think it's important work and you're right, there is a certain degree of burnout because you are always concerned, it is a sort of relentless process, but the community structures itself so that you have people doing different jobs and moving across and taking on different missions. So the intelligence community and National Geospatial Intelligence Agency is also hiring, especially if you like geospatial or geography. But what's really interesting in the intelligence community, and I know this is about, is about terrorism, is our intelligence analysts, when I grew up, I had a puzzle piece, and it went in a specific place on a puzzle. Our analysts right now are doing the mosaics. It's almost as if, hey, who stayed at Holiday Inn Express tonight? We just had something happen in Moldova that we don't have experts that have been seeped in that. So we are really asking our, asking our analysts to look at mosaics. One, one day it's terrorism, next day it's the kidnapping for Boko Haram, the next day you know it's an Iranian missile launch, it, it's, it's North Korea on a, on a daily basis. So our intelligence community is really very broad and vast in what, what we look at. We, the out-of-the-box thinking that these young folks bring to our agency invigorates us old folks. We need their thinking. <laughs> we need out-of-the-box. They haven't been, no, this is how we do it. This is the way it's always been done. They challenge us. And it's because they come in and they fix our VCRs and they do all this stuff that we've never done. You still have a VCR? It's the phones. <laughs> it's the phones. So if we're going to fight them on their equal terms with virtual caliphate, 
this is the success right here. This is a success. Bruce, any last thoughts to send us out? Well, I mean, I've worked in think tanks in the intelligence community briefly and in academe, and I have to say that from my experience in both the CIA and the FBI, it was a true search for the truth amongst the analysts. I mean, just the highest ideals of academe, that's what we're supposed to be doing is searching for the truth. And that's what I always admired from the analysts and operators that I, that, that I worked with, is that was exactly their mission, and to keep us safe. Search for the truth, that's a great place to end, and something in common with journalism. Thank you very much. Thanks to you all. <laughs>